Well, good morning and welcome. It is so good to be with you here this morning and being among the people of God, knowing that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is alive and well among us this morning as we worship together, as we listen to his word, and we greet each other with the fellowship of believers. Uh, Would you begin this morning with us by standing and let's worship God together. Great glory. 
Lord God, you sent us Jesus, who truly is the king who draws all people to him. And we praise you this morning for his life, for his death, for his resurrection, and the invitation that we have to know him and to personally relate with you because of what he has done on the cross. May this morning our hearts burn within us as we listen to your scriptures and as we continue to worship together. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, Cindy. Thanks to Richard. And for the 12 singers, well done, well done. If you notice to my left, the flower, the pink flower, uh, that's for Cora May um, Arie. Uh, that's the, this is, parents are Joshua and Rachel. Rachel is the daughter of Bruce and, and uh, Donna Evick. So that's the connection there. But uh, Cora was born on March 20th. So congratulations. I'm sure they're not here this morning, but uh, new birth is always wonderful. Tonight, tonight we have the prayer meeting. It'll be at 6.30, 6.30 in the great room. And there's prayer cards, and those yellow cards are prayer requests. If there's something you want to praise the Lord about or request of the Lord, uh, use those cards, and when the Take the offering at the end. You can put them in the offering plate. But that's tonight, 630. Uh, join us if you've never come before. Don't be afraid to come and, and just join us. You don't have to pray out loud if that may, may scare you, but just join us. It's very encouraging for the people that pray on a regular basis to have new people come. So join us if you can. Uh, secondly, uh, the Easter jail ministry. And you see it, <clears throat> it's for cookies. Uh, if you could bring those cookies that you want to bake for the, for the inmates at the jail, it's very encouraging for them to receive that and let, let them know that they're uh, thought of and prayed over. Anyway, there's some information there. Uh, bring those by April 10th if you would do that. In our Easter worship, the Monday, Thursday service, uh, April 14th, that'll be at 6.30. Uh, the Easter services on Sunday then, or Saturday will be that won't be live streamed, just remember that. It won't be filmed, but um, that'll be at 6 o'clock here. And then the three services on Sunday. And if you could let us know which one you'd be coming to, that helps us to plan well. So RSVP online, uh, church app, or the website. And then, of course, as usual, uh, we have our offering at the doors at the end of the service. For those of you who were here last week, wasn't that great with Teen Challenge? They did a great job. And that's like a local ministry. And so when you give, it's for this kind of thing that we had last week, as well as worldwide missions. So join us together as we, as we finance these different and wonderful uh, ministries that are going on. God bless you. I-90 heading towards South Dakota and Rapid City, and as you're on that stretch of road, which is one of my favorite places to travel on the road trips in upper Midwest, you will see numerous signs. They're all over. In fact, it feels like you see more signs than you do road markers or roadkill. You'd have to be either fast asleep for several hours or completely blindfolded to miss what's potentially coming up. In my mind, I can picture the jackalope on the billboard as it looks down at me, the T-Rex, the pictures of the gift shop, the five cent cup of coffee, and the free ice cold water. You know what I'm talking about? Wall drug, that's right. It, it is impossible to miss. If you are heading anywhere on Interstate 90, you'll see signs for days. In fact, if you were to call their uh, marketing team up, don't ask me if, how I know this, and ask them exactly how many signs they have, there are roughly 300 signs 
that they have paid for and plenty more that other people have just put out uh, for fun. Wall drug itself is really not as good as the signs indicate. <laughs> I brought my family there two years ago, and I hyped it up to my kids, and they were like, Dad, what's a jackalope? And they were excited, and we were getting closer, and then we get there, and they're looking around, and they're like, this is it? <laughs> this is what this is? I'm like, yeah, it's wall drug. Isn't it great? But you know, that is not the case with Easter. There are numerous signs, and I often wonder, did Jesus feel the same way about Easter that I have driving on I-90 towards Waldrug about the signs for that place? <laughs> did he see all these signs and know these signs and wonder, how could you miss this? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today as we launch into our Easter series about the power of the resurrection. So if you'd bow with me and let's pray before we open the text. Heavenly Father, we recognize what you did. In hundreds and thousands of years before even the moment of Easter, you started to foreshadow what would take place. And God, you were faithful to send your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to rise again that we might have eternal life. And Lord, as we uncover and look at the signs that foreshadow the coming of Easter, may our hearts confirm to us what our minds are saying, and that is you are God, and you are faithful, and you are true. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All signs point to Easter. If you have been reading along with us in the one year Bible, uh, you may or may not be bogged down with certain texts and rules and things that are going on in genealogies, but amongst all the things that you're seeing in the text, you will have noticed many different signs that point towards what God is going to do. Because that's what he's done in the Old Testament, is that he's given us a roadmap of sorts as we travel towards the destination of Easter. And as this series begins this week, we'll talk about the foreshadowing or the signs that we've seen thus far as we journey towards Easter. There was a little bit of a road trip that Jesus went on with two disciples, and that's the story that I'm going to look at today. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to examine the road trip to Emmaus, the road trip to Emmaus. A uh, little background, um, Emmaus was about seven miles from Jerusalem, and if you're familiar with the topography of the area, things are either up or down in most directions, so seven miles wasn't a flat, straight seven-mile trek, uh, so it took some time to get there. And this is a, the day of the resurrection of Christ that this is taking place. So you have two disciples who are leaving Jerusalem. And at the moment they're leaving Jerusalem, they're a little bit disappointed because they had some expectation about what Jesus was supposed to do when he came to the city and what was supposed to take place. They had a lot of expectation with many disciples. Uh, on this trip, they encounter Jesus, but they don't recognize him, and he shows up in their life. So starting with verse 13, uh, I'm going to read this, and we're going to talk about some of the signs that we see as we walk along on this journey. Verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Pause here for just a second. So you have the resurrected Jesus in bodily form showing up to two disciples who were leaving Jerusalem, headed down to Emmaus. And it always fascinates me because I'm asking questions like this as a pastor all the time. What does a resurrected body look like? In our minds, in most cartoons or animations or depictions I've seen, it's this glorious glowing body with flowing robes and the halos and, and this resurrection picture of Jesus and clouds and all this stuff. But here you have the newly resurrected Christ walking along with two men who didn't observe him any differently than they would another sojourner coming from the town of Jerusalem. And so here comes Jesus walking along with them in his new resurrected body, looking somewhat normal. But at the same time, they didn't recognize him. And when I ask myself about that text, I, I often think about how many times I have come across somebody that I know but didn't recognize, and it's usually the context. 
right? You see them someplace you didn't expect them to be. Uh, so in some way, shape, or form, they, they just didn't recognize that this was, was Jesus. So let's continue with verse 17. So he asks them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asks. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. I'll pause there for a moment. Uh, what I love about the text is that there is plenty of normal everyday interactions in the biblical text. And uh, Jesus, in his masterful way, he asks questions. And what do the disciples do? <laughs> They sarcastically reply to the Son of God, <laughs> Are you the only one who has not heard of what's going on? How could you miss these things? They assumed that he was just another traveler like them who was visiting the town, who was well aware of what was going on because it was a big deal. And if you were a Jew and you were in town, you knew about it. So it must have been pretty interesting for Jesus to hear them interpret and tell his story in this moment. It would have been pretty fascinating, actually. So here we go with verse 20. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. I'll stop there for a second. These two disciples were thoroughly confused. <laughs> they were there. They had an expectation. They thought something would happen. It didn't happen. And then, as we know from the biblical account, the women went to the tomb. The angel shows up, says he's no longer here. He's risen. The women go back to the disciples. The disciples are like, what's going on? And somehow, these two men, who were not among the 11, there used to be 12, but we know about Judas, these men were there, they understood what was taking place, and they were just confused. They had hoped for a redeemed Israel. They thought the nation would be different when Jesus came and asserted his kingship or authority or whatever he was planning to do. Uh, we like to fill in the gaps of what we think Jesus will do, and these disciples were, were no different than us in that instance. But he didn't come for just one nation. And so now it's Jesus' turn to share. And so he does so in verse 25. So look at 25. He said to them, how foolish are you and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Foolish and slow to believe. Ouch. <laughs> I would not like to be those ones in that moment. But what does Jesus do here? He begins with Moses and all of the prophets, and he starts to open the Bible to them and explain all of the things that pointed, all of the signs that indicated what had taken place. Jesus used the Old Testament to explain himself. And really, as I, I read this text in preparation for this morning, I thought, come on, Luke, <laughs> couldn't you have like put a list together of all the things Jesus said in that moment? <laughs> I would have loved to hear a commentary on the Old Testament by the Son of God. But the text doesn't tell us exactly what Jesus said. It just says that he opened up the text and the scriptures to these men, and he shared all of the signs that pointed, all the scriptures that pointed to himself. And so I ask this question, how does the past make sense of the present in the future? How does the past make sense of the present in the future? It was important to Christ to go back and examine and look at and talk about what had happened in the past, what God had done in order to make sense of what that moment was all about and what the future would bring. 
Um, we think about this a lot when it comes to history. Uh, you've heard the phrase, history repeats itself. Uh, a lot of times, history gives us indication to maybe why uh, things in the very moment that we're living in are the way they are or the direction that they're headed. Uh, growing up in, in my own home, my, my mom saved everything. <laughs> everything. I love my mom to death. She is probably one of the most uh, conservative, um, just uh, careful stewards of resource that I have ever met. In fact, we'd go into a McDonald's restaurant as a kid, and I just remember all the disposable things that you should throw away would end up in the vehicle coming home with us and in the cupboard. Uh, cups, uh, plastic silverware, things like that. And she just collected things. And so whenever we had a need for something, of course, she had the massive purse with all kinds of things in them, um, extra ketchups and mayos and napkins and straws. And I'm like, you know, just save all these things. And so growing up, it always kind of baffled me, you know, why she did that. And then as I got to know my mom better and hear her story from growing up, I realized that it was the economic reality that she grew up in and uh, her parents uh, serving in World War II and, and the situation that they were in and, and all those things that had taken place that caused her to, to be very careful with her resource because they just didn't have any. And so, of course, I've uh, been married now for, for a number of years. And my wife always asks me, how come you never throw anything away? <laughs> Like, let me tell you a story. <laughs> she does, and she'll try to take, you know, my old t-shirts from doing youth ministry out of the closet and throw them away, and then I always find them, because uh, I like to check the trash to make sure she's not throwing away my treasures, and then I have to store them up. Um, it's a thing. But I, I, I tell people whenever I do pre-marriage counseling, I'm like, believe it or not, but you will become like your parents. <laughs> it, it's going to be a thing. Because history right? History has something to do with how we are living today, what we've experienced, the life that we've gone through, uh, the highs, the lows, and it really has a trajectory of the direction that our lives are, are heading. And this is why, this is why the Old Testament is so important to the story of Easter, critically important. I talk to a lot of people who will tell me, you know what, that Old Testament is just tough. It's hard to read. I don't understand. It seems like God's different there than he is here. But let me tell you something. If it is important for Jesus Christ to explain himself using the Old Testament, then it is absolutely critical for us to know the stories and how they point to Easter. And so that's what we're going to look at today because history explains who God is, his faithfulness, the direction that he's taking his people and that does bring about some joy and hope in our lives, and it does paint a full picture of Easter as we start this series. So I want to look at three specific Old Testament stories, um, and if again, if you've been in the one-year Bible, these should be familiar to you because you've recently read them, but I'll explain them anyways because they are uh, very important to what we're going to be talking about. Story number one, this is the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. I'm uh, going to be covering a lot of ground in the text, so feel free to bounce around. It is in the app, or you can see it on the screen behind you, or uh, look it up in your text in front of you. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 says this, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So we have this individual situation between Moses and God. And if you're familiar with the story, what happened was Moses grew up in Egypt. Uh, if you remember, his mom put him in the basket, sent him down the river. Uh, he gets brought into uh, the household of the elite in Egypt. He gets trained and raised. And by about age 40, he notices as he's out walking around an Egyptian treating an Israelite horribly. So he's beating this Israelite, and Moses kills the Egyptian, hides the Egyptian, thinks no one saw him, he's off scot-free. Somebody blows a whistle on Moses, and he has to flee the country. And so for the next 40 years, Moses is wandering around the desert, basically as a shepherd. And as he is out in the wilderness, he comes across a bush that's on fire. And like any curious guys watching this thing go up in flames, thinking, Ah, huh, it's burning, but it's actually not going up in flames. And so he approaches the bush, and God speaks to him and confronts him. So Moses takes his sandals off as he's on holy ground, and he has this conversation with God. And God says, I'm going to send you to go and rescue my people from Egypt. And Moses, of course, as I would probably be in this moment as well, 
has this question. Okay, so I go to the people, and uh, there's like this whole nation of Egypt, and they're, they're powerful, and, and, and it's just me going to these people and to Pharaoh and saying, hey, let the people go. And, and he gets to this moment, he says, well, what am I supposed to tell them about whose authority I'm coming on or why I'm here? <laughs> and what does God say? He says, I am has sent me to you. You see, God has a pattern of using us as his representatives in this world. By sending us, not just pastors, but you all in this room, by prompting us and sending us out into the world to do his work on his authority. This is the God of the Bible. It's a pattern that he's established from very early on. John 8, 58, Jesus connects the dots here. Beautiful passage, John 8, 58. A little clue of who Jesus says he is, and listen closely to the wording. Jesus says this, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. In this very moment, Jesus says, I am. And to every one of those Jewish listeners, when they heard those two words, they had either one of two responses, or maybe both. They thought, heresy, how can this man say that he is on equal footing with the God who showed up to Moses to give him authority to go do those miraculous things in Egypt. Jesus was equating himself with the I am of the burning bush. That's one response. The other response is, this is God. It has to be. Because who else could say that he is the I am? Jesus became a burning bush to all people. God shows up to his people through Christ. What used to be a sign in the wilderness is now a physical human being standing in front of people saying, I am. And if you're familiar with the resurrection account and you get to Matthew 28, what does Jesus do? At the very end as he's ascending, he says, he says this, all authority has been given to me. Now go, baptize and lead people teach them, make disciples, and be my ambassadors into this world. Not just to one man as God was to Moses, but to all of them and to us as well. Um, I take that really seriously. I, I think about this a lot, and this is one of those few things that kind of keep me up at night. <clears throat> it's the one question that I expect God to ask me when I get to heaven. I don't expect to ask him to ask me, you know, did you uh, do this right or sing this song in the right way? Or was your heart right here? What's going on with this? Or or did you attend church enough? I I really do expect Christ to ask me this, this one thing. Did you do the one thing I told you to do when I left? Did you go make disciples and baptize them? That kind of eats away at me because that was what God had called his disciples and the disciples had called other disciples and and so on and so forth, that we are expected to be his ambassadors the same way that God showed up to Moses in a burning bush and said, come follow me and do what I'm asking you to do. Then Jesus came and gave that. And if you've ever asked, well, whose authority do I go on? It's the I am. This last October, I had a chance to go on a men's retreat with, uh, with a group of men that most of them I hadn't met before from all various states and countries. And we actually met just uh, not too far from here in Cross Lake. And, and as I was meeting with these men and, and talking with them, uh, one particular man was sharing a little bit of his story. And I, I caught that he had just recently made a profession of faith. I mean, very recently. And, and so I, I sought him out, just kind of felt the prompting from God, like, you need to go like, chat with this guy and, and see where he's at and encourage him a little bit. So I sat down with, with Paul, and him and I talked for, for a long time. And he shared his life with me. Uh, just recently retired, uh, great gentleman, uh, just super energetic, and just shared his story, and we talked about these things. And, and then God just prompted me, and I, I said, Paul, you, you accepted Christ recently. He's like, yeah, you know, I really have just come into my faith, and, and this is, uh, you know, Jesus has redeemed me, and he was excited about it, and we shared a lot of time together. And, and, and then I said, Paul, have you been baptized before? He said, no. And the house we were staying in was on a lake, and granted, it's October. And by this time, it was like one in the morning, we were up talking, and I said, okay, I'm going to pray for you right now, and I want you to think about this. But tomorrow morning, 
I'll baptize you with all these men, and you can make a profession of faith. And he said, all right. The next morning, I baptized him in the frigid water in the Cross Lake chain up in Cross Lake. And I thought, you know what? These are the kinds of things that Christ has called us to do, to break into the lives of other people, to know their stories and lead them to Christ and do what Jesus gave us that authority to do. Uh, Another story. This one uh, also should be very familiar to you. This is the Passover story. So if you go to Exodus chapter 12, another sign of Easter before Easter. Exodus 12 verse 13 says this, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So fast forward from the moment when God called Moses through the burning bush to go to Egypt. Uh, Moses goes, although he first complains that he can't speak well. So then Aaron comes with him, and the two of them go. They confront Pharaoh, uh, let my people go. Maybe you know the song. I won't sing it for you this morning. And Pharaoh says, no, I won't let your people go. And so then the plagues happen. And they get to the last plague, and this is the plague of the death of the firstborn. And God says to his people, he says, to avoid succumbing to this plague that I am going to put over the entire land, you are going to make a sacrifice and put the blood of that sacrifice over the doorpost of the homes with within you dwell. I love this story. Why do I love this story? Because here's what the text doesn't say. It doesn't say the angel of the Lord's going to pass over, go inside and check to make sure everyone is holy to make sure that no one's sinned recently or that they've, they've gone to church enough or they've done the right things or none of that. It's simply this. If you are inside the dwelling and the blood has covered the doorpost, then you are covered by the blood. And in that way, the angel of the Lord passes over and you're not brought under that plague, but you're free from it. And how oftentimes do we think about this, even in our own faith today, that that there's got to be something more. Trinity preached on this for some time in the book of Galatians, but it's not Jesus plus anything. Even in the Passover moment, it was only in faith, put the blood over the doorpost, and every occupant in that home will be saved. What a beautiful foreshadowing of what was to come. The sacrifice, the atonement of the blood, and the people covered by the blood. People didn't need to be worthy, just covered. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5-7 talks a little bit about the connecting of the dots here. And he says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Jesus is our Passover lamb. You see, God didn't leave his people in Egypt. He sent somebody. And when Moses went, God did miraculous things. He provided a way for the people to come out of slavery with blood. You look at Easter and the significance of it, and you see the richness and the depth of what God was foreshadowing in this moment that it was the blood of the true sacrifice of the sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ, that covers us, that we don't need to be worthy, just covered. Did you know that Jesus was crucified on Passover? Wow. This is not accidental. You see, God is constantly signaling these things in the Old Testament. And as you read through and you get these story after story after story, they're so intentional and they're meant to constantly point toward Jesus Christ. Our need for him, the significance of his sacrifice, the covering of his blood, his death and his resurrection. And it's story after story like this where we see Easter before Easter. I love the Old Testament. It is such a beautiful setup to the person of Christ. There's one more story here that I want to cover, and that's this one. This is the bread from heaven. 
Uh, so if you fast forward from the people having been uh, enslaved and Moses through the burning bush was sent to them, and then he goes to Pharaoh and he releases the people eventually after the death of the firstborn and the Passover moment that we have in that time. And now the people are wandering around and they are hungry. <laughs> What's a good wilderness trip without being hungry? Um, I know from personal experience that uh, I have plenty of travel treats in my car because uh, my kids and my wife do like their snacks in a vehicle because, of course, when you're traveling, uh, it's important to have some food. So here we have Moses, and I can probably relate in this moment, uh, where all the people are just grumbling and complaining, and they're hangry, right? They want food, and they're saying things like, it would be better if we weren't on this trip, if we were back in Egypt, because we had food back there, and yada, yada, so on and so forth. And uh, so then you have God providing for them here in Exodus 16, verse 4. It says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. Uh, it's interesting to me here that, that every step along the way, God's constantly setting the people up for an instance of faith, right? That the people have to have enough faith to obey. God's going to provide, but that doesn't absolve people from having to have faith in those moments that he provides. So what does God say? Just collect enough, and then on this last day, collect enough for a couple of days so you can take a Sabbath. And so he's giving them these examples to follow. God sends this bread to them from heaven. Very important wording here. There is more foreshadowing, more Easter setup that happens in this story. So fast forward to John chapter 6, and Jesus talks about this very story. In John chapter 6, Jesus says this in verse 32. Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Even in this very moment, they were confused. They thought Jesus was just the giver of the bread. Oh no, he was the bread that came from heaven. And not a bread to meet a physical need, but a bread to meet the spiritual need. And as you go all the, through the Old Testament, you see this constant tension right? Where God's breaking into their lives and trying to bring them into this place where they're spiritually connected to him. And all the people could do was see the physical reality of the circumstance that they were in. We're hungry, we're in this situation, we're in that situation. And, and the people just constantly complained about these things. God knew what they needed. And of course he provided for their physical needs, but God knew they needed a spiritual reconciliation that they were not right with God and they needed to be connected to him. And so the bread from heaven, while in Exodus was a story of a physical need being met, was a foreshadowing of the true bread from heaven where God would meet a spiritual need by sending his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what he says. He says, it's me. The bread from heaven is truly Jesus. Our real need is spiritual and not physical. So let's wrap up this road trip a little bit. Jesus, again, I picked three stories out of the Old Testament. I have no idea what he told these men as they were walking along the road to Emmaus. I would love to know. But I just guessed at a few stories that he may have alluded to because uh, uh, they're in the text and they talk about Moses and some of the rest of them. But here we are at the end of the road trip to Emmaus. Jesus has opened their eyes to the scripture. He's painting a picture of what's going on. And they get to the destination, to where they were going, this village. And Jesus sits down with them. And here we go in Luke 24, verse 30. So Luke 24, verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? What a cool moment. 
that you have Jesus breaking bread. This is why I put the bread story in there, because I wouldn't be surprised if Jesus finished with that story, right? And, and maybe talked a little bit about Passover and, and, and the moment of sharing this bread together. And then he sits down and actually breaks the bread. And their eyes just get open in a flash. And they recognize this was Jesus. It's just mind-blowing. When was the moment when you got it? When was the moment that the burning in your heart over the scripture, over what the Holy Spirit was stirring up in you, went from just a stirring to a full-on getting it moment where your eyes were opened and you saw Jesus? Verse 33 in Luke 24. Here's what they do as a result. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. So they went right back where they came from. They found the eleven, the disciples, and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. More confirmation of the risen Savior in bodily form walking amongst his disciples. I I love this story because these men, they had to have been tired, right? Just came seven miles from Jerusalem, ran all the way back up the hill, back to the disciples because they were so excited that they had just seen Jesus Christ, the risen Lord and Savior. All signs of Jesus in the past give us hope in the present and the future. Let me say that again. All the signs of Jesus in the past give us hope in the present and into the future. What do you think fueled those men to run back to Jerusalem to tell their fellow disciples, hey, what just happened? I saw Jesus. He broke bread with us. It was the joy in their lives from recognizing the risen Savior right in front of them. It was the hope that they now had that who once had died and said he would rise again, actually did it. That no longer was Jesus down and out in their expectation for a rising up of their nation to reclaim its rightful place in the land that God had promised them. It was no, it was Jesus had now died and rose again. He was a Passover lamb. He had become the burning bush to send out his ambassadors to the world to meet people's spiritual needs. Jesus came, he died, he resurrected, and it absolutely changes how we see the present and the future. If there was one thing that I would share with anybody about the Christian faith, it's not about behavior modification. It's not about how you should live different like this, or this should happen, or, or no, it's about the fact that Jesus did what he said he would do. He came as bread from heaven. He walked this earth. He followed exactly the plan that God had for the people that the people couldn't follow. He did everything without sin. He died as the only sacrifice that could cover and atone for our sins, and he rose again. And that is what gives me joy and what gives me hope. I see life daily because of that. I see every circumstance around me when I feel sad, lonely, dejected, like those disciples did when they had an expectation and they didn't see it come to fruition. I get in those moments and I think, you know what? Jesus rose from the grave and my life has died with him and it is now alive with him as well. That is how we as the people of God are to live life differently. Everything that we see in the present and everything we see into the future is not merely about the physical. We're simply spiritual beings having a physical experience. But the truth is that God did something, he brought us back into relationship with him. And these bodies are going to die. 100% chance that these bodies are going to die. They're not going to last forever. But if our lives are buried with Christ and risen with Christ, then spiritually we will be alive with him forever. And so I, I leave you with this question. And it's this, have you recognized Jesus in your life? 
Have you recognized Jesus in your life? Um, as we get closer to Easter, it's a natural time because people generally know what Easter is and, and that you go to church, and these are the moments that, that we do have spiritual conversations. It's a really easy segue to break the ice and have a spiritual conversation with a coworker, a neighbor, a friend, but just to ask the question like, hey, where, where are you going to church for Easter? Right? And especially if you know they're not churched and they're not a part of a body of believers, and just say, why don't you, why don't you come with? And come be a part of this and see what, what we're doing here. And, and I mean, you got to go someplace on Easter. I mean, it's Easter, right? It's a natural invite. But why did those two disciples run all the way back to Jerusalem? Because they recognized Jesus. If you and I take time to look back in our lives and the history of our life and what God has done, those moments when he broke into our life and did things that are unexplainable but miraculous, and we see Jesus for who he is, both in the Old Testament and in the history of our lives, how can we not want to go the extra seven miles to tell people about what happened? Wouldn't the joy just be welling up in us so much that we'll want to say, you got to know that this Jesus who said he would die and he did it, and he's alive. One of my favorite life verses, um, and that, that man that I had baptized uh, back in October, um, he doesn't live in the state, and he, uh, somebody reached out to me because they were sponsoring him spiritually on a, uh, uh, on a prayer walk this week called The Road to Emmaus. <laughs> I didn't know that until after I planned my sermon, and I'm like, that's funny. God has a sense of humor in some of these things. Um, but they said, we want you to write a letter. Uh, write a letter of encouragement in, for this man as he walks this journey and goes through these uh, times of spiritual reflection. And I wrote in there my life verse, or one of the verses I consider my life verse. And that's Philippians 1.6. And it says this, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion. We can be confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion. You see, if God has ever shown up in your life, I pray that it gives you hope and joy that during this Easter season that you are wanting to go and tell people about this Jesus. But I would also pray for you that as you look into the future and you think about what the future holds, regardless of what the present circumstances are, that you would be confident that if God has shown up at all in your life, that he will carry his good work on in you until the day of completion. And that is good news. Would you bow with me as I pray? Heavenly Father, I just want to lift up to you this morning um, the many, many people that we all know in this room, uh, neighbors, friends, family members, uh, those people who may not have recognized you yet, Jesus. I pray that our hearts, as we turn towards Easter, would be so overwhelmed with the joy that comes from having our eyes seeing the living Savior, that we would be like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, tired from the journey, but ready to press on because we are hopeful and excited about what's to come. So may we be those people. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
Amen. My encouragement to you as you go today uh, is to know that the great I am, Jesus Christ, has given you the authority to run back to Jerusalem, (laughs) to go and tell people about the excitement that you have having seen Jesus in your life. So go in the grace and peace in the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ and get excited about this coming Easter. Have a great day.